The title of this lecture is Monasticism. What is monasticism? Monasticism refers to the regimen of life practiced by monks. It originated in the deserts of northern Egypt in the third century AD. There are, in fact, two types of monastic life, both of which we will look at in this presentation. They are Eremitic monasticism and Cenobitic monasticism. Eremitic monasticism refers to monasticism lived in individual isolation, that is, the life of a hermit. Cenobitic monasticism, on the other hand, refers to monastic life practiced in a communal setting, that is, in a monastery. The founder of Eremitic monasticism was Anthony of Egypt. He was born around 251 AD and died in 356, so he lived to the ripe old age of 105. He was the son of a wealthy family. His parents died when Antony was 18. While in church, he heard the call of Jesus read from the gospel. If you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven. And come, follow me. Antony took this as applying directly to himself. He therefore sold his possessions, placed his younger sister in the care of a women's community, an early group of nuns, and went to live in the desert. He went to live in a remote and Roman fort. In his isolation, he devoted himself to fasting, scripture reading, long hours of prayer, and physical deprivation. became an example of spiritual warfare, for here he was attacked relentlessly by demons. We read in his biography, written by Athanasius of Alexandria, but the devil, who hates and envies what is good, could not endure to see such a resolution in a youth, but endeavored to carry out against him what he had been wont to effect against others. First of all, he tried to lead him away from the discipline, whispering to him the remembrance of his wealth, care for his sister, claims of kindred, love of money, love of glory, the various pleasures of the table, and the other relaxations of life, and at least the difficulty of virtue and the labor of it. He suggested also the infirmity of the body and the length of the time. In a word, he raised in his mind a great dust of debate, wishing to debar him from his settled purpose. But when the enemy saw himself to be too weak for Antony's determination, and that he rather was conquered by the other's firmness, overthrown by this great faith, and falling through his constant prayers, then at length putting his trust in the weapons which are in the navel of his belly, and boasting in them, for they are his first snare for the young, he attacked the young man, disturbing him by night and harassing him by day, so that even the onlookers saw the struggle which was going on between them. One would suggest foul thoughts, and the other counter them with prayers. The one fire him with lust, the other, as one who seemed to blush, fortify his body with faith, prayers, and fasting. And the devil, unhappy white, one night even took upon himself the shape of a woman and imitated all her acts simply to beguile Anthony. But he, his mind filled with Christ and the nobility inspired by him, and considering the spirituality of the soul, quenched the coal of the other's deceit. Again, the enemy suggested the ease of pleasure, but he, like a man filled with rage and grief, turned his thoughts to the threatened fire and gnawing worm, and setting these in array against his adversary, passed through the temptation unscathed. All this was a source of shame to his foe, for he, deeming himself like God, was now mocked by a young man, and he who boasted himself against flesh and blood was being put to flight by a man of the flesh, for the Lord was working with Antony. The Lord who, for our sake, took flesh and gave the body victory over the devil. So that all who truly fight can say, not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Antony soon developed a reputation for holiness. People came to him seeking spiritual advice. He attracted followers who set up their huts near his abode. His life became a, the paradigm or model for the ascetical life 
and the life of Antony, written by Athanasius, became widely read both in the East and in the West. Now, central to Anthony's spirituality was the practice of asceticism. Asceticism involves denying oneself legitimate bodily goods for the sake of a higher spiritual good. Examples of this include fasting, long periods of prayer during which one deprives oneself of sleep, wearing coarse, uncomfortable clothes, bathing in cold water, and such things. Such practices are always accompanied by prayer and meditation for the purpose of fixing the mind upon God and God alone. Asceticism, thus understood, is essential to the monastic life. Now we turn to Pacomius, a contemporary of Antony, and who was also one of the founding fathers of monasticism. Unlike Antony, who was born to Christian parents, Pacomius converted to Christianity from paganism. Upon his conversion, he became a hermit, but after six or seven years, he decided to establish a community of monks. Pacomius found that a communal setting with both spiritual and material support was the most conducive to successfully leading the monastic life. However, such a life lived in common could easily become chaotic. To offset this tendency, Pacomius composed a rule for monks to regulate life in his community. The rule had specified times for prayer and work. In the course of his life, Pacomius founded a total of nine monasteries, seven for men and two for women. Now we come to Benedict of Nursia. He is the father of Cenobitic monasticism in, the, in Western Europe. Like Pacomius, Benedict composed a rule for monks which became the standard regimen for all monasteries in the West. Prologue, the rule of Benedict emphasizes two things, listening and obedience. The rule reads, listen my son to your master's precepts and incline the ear of your heart. Receive willingly and carry out effectively your loving father's advice, that by the labor of obedience you may return to him from whom you had departed by the sloth of disobedience. In addition, Benedict uses three images or metaphors of the monastic life in his rule. First, he understands the monastery as a battlefield. He writes, we must prepare our hearts and our bodies to do battle under the holy obedience of his commands. And let us ask God that he be pleased to give us the help of his grace for anything which our nature finds hardly possible. And if we want to escape the pains of hell and attain life everlasting, then while there is still time, while we are still in the body and are able to fulfill all these things by the light of this life, we must hasten to do now what will profit us for eternity. Second, Benedict envisions the monastery as a school. He writes, we are going to establish a school for the service of the Lord. In founding it, we hope to introduce nothing harsh or burdensome. But if a certain strictness results from the dictates of equity for the amendment of vices or the preservation of charity, do not be at once dismayed and fly away from the way of salvation, whose entrance cannot but be narrow. For as we advance in the religious life and in faith, our hearts expand, and we run the way of God's commandments with unspeakable sweetness of love. Thus, never departing from his school, but persevering in the monastery according to his teaching until death, we may with patience share in the sufferings of Christ and deserve to have a share also in his kingdom. Thus, the monastery for Benedict is a unique kind of school where one, where one learns the way of salvation. The school is strict, as is any good school. But its rewards are well worth the toil and effort, these rewards being an expanded heart, sweetness of love, and ultimately eternal salvation. Third, Benedict sees the monastery as a workshop. Good works, such as love of God and neighbor, chastising the body, fasting, fasting, the corporal works of mercy, are tools of the spiritual craft. Benedict continues, if we employ them unceasingly, day and night, and return them on the day of judgment, our compensation from the Lord will be that will be that wage he has promised. I has not seen nor ear heard what God has promised for those who love him. Thus, the origins of monasticism and the founding fathers of Antony, Pacomius, and Benedict. We now turn to the general characteristics of communal monastic life as it developed in Western Christendom. A monk was required to take a threefold vow of obedience, stability, and conversion. 
And taking the vow of obedience, the monk, the monk promised obedience to the superior, the abbot of the community. This was the concrete expression of the monk's ultimate obedience to God. In the vow of stability, the, monks, the monk promised to remain in the monastery where he became a monk. Finally, in the vow of conversion, the monk promised to devote himself to the monastic way of life, prayer, asceticism, humility, work, and study. In a, life in a monastery is structured according to three activities, prayer, study, and labor. One of these activities is prayer. St. Anthony spent hours in prayer. It was the engine both of, the, of his personal spiritual growth and of his spiritual warfare. Communal monks practice a very structured type of prayer known as the divine office, which consists of liturgical prayers, psalms from the Old Testament, and chants. It is done at specific hours of the day, dawn, mid-morning, noon, 3 p.m., evening, and before bed, and it is done in common. It was another important part of the daily life of a monk. The monks referred to it as Lexio Divina, literally divine reading. Lexio Divina consists of a devout, prayerful, and meditative reading of sacred literature, which includes scripture, the church fathers, and the lives and writings of the saints. Through such study, through Lexio Divina, the monk seeks sapientia, wisdom, as opposed to mere scientia or knowledge. It is learning put to the service of one's spiritual goal, personal union with God. Labor was also an important part of the daily life of a monk. Each monk had to contribute to the survival and prosperity of the monastery. Certain tasks were performed in a monastery, such as agriculture, cooking, woodworking, leatherworking, and copying manuscripts. Each monk was, ex was expected to spend some time each day performing some kind of assigned work. This fostered a spirituality of work. Any task, however menial, is done for the glory of God and the service of one's neighbor. It also fostered humility, which is the defining virtue of the monk. Now let's explore humility. According to Benedict's rule, humility involves a number of things. Submission to one's superior, patient endurance of all that is inflicted upon oneself, confessing one's sins to the abbot, accepting crude and unpleasant tasks, and speaking only when questioned. All of these were directed towards the uprooting of pride, the deadliest of all sins. The goal of a life ordered to humility was the perfection of charity, that is, love for God and love for neighbor for the sake of God. Quoting the first letter of John, Benedict calls charity that perfect love which casts out fear. It is also a love that fosters contrition, that is, sorrow for sin, not because one fears hell, but because one has offended the God whom one loves. So the whole point of the strict regimen is to become perfected in love for God and neighbor which is the true root of personal purity and victory over sin. In conclusion, monasticism was the single most important institution in the early Middle Ages. It became the spiritual and cultural epicenter of early medieval Europe. In the words of early 20th century Catholic historian Hilaire Belloc, the great order of St. Benedict formed a framework of living points upon which was stretched the moral life of Europe.